I'm going to talk about levels of faith and levels of doubt. Not to discourage, but to encourage you in your walk and your journey with Jesus. Faith, doubt. They challenge each other. Sometimes they battle each other. I'm going to talk about some different levels of faith we have. Number one, I believe that God gives you the ability at birth to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God where you can go to heaven. I believe that. I believe everyone has this ability. It may need to be cultivated, may need to be awakened through a prophecy, a song, a message, but it, you have that. Number two, another thing, these are to Christians only. You have a measure of faith. This is given to believers. That measure of faith is to operate in your gift or in your calling which God has placed upon you, whether it be missions, pastor, whatever it is. There's, and, that, and that says in Romans 12 and 3, as God has dealt to each one of us a measure of faith. He measures it out to believers. Number three, there's a faith to believe, on, believe, believe beyond the measure of faith. And that's the faith you develop that measure. You grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. Romans 10 says, so faith cometh by hearing. And hearing the word of God. You're going to do that this morning. You did it in the song. You're going to do it in this service. The fourth kind of faith I want to talk about. We've all been there. We hate it. But it's a struggling faith. A man's child was controlled by a demon. A father. He requested Jesus to deliver him. Jesus said, can you believe? Do you believe? This man immediately, John Mark 9 said, the father began to cry out and he began to do it with tears. He was so moved. He said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. All of us have been there and we'll probably be there again. It's a place you don't want to live. You only want to visit. Number five, Jesus speaks about a great faith. In Matthew 15, a girl has a demon She's controlled by it. The mother is obsessed with her deliverance. She goes to Jesus. She pleads. She begs. He rejects her. Finally, he said, dogs cannot come in here. In other words, Gentiles cannot have the benefits of, of the Jews. She said, at least let the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from your table. Give me something they have rejected. And Jesus looked at her, and he said, you have great faith. Be it unto you as you desire. I want you to notice that. Be it unto you as you desire. When you pray, your desires are important in prayer. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. I feel led of God to tell you, don't stop asking. Continue to pray. Continue to ask and believe God. Luke 7, a, a, a Roman soldier, a centurion, 80 people under him. He's got a servant dying. Send for Jesus. Come, pray for my servant. Jesus on the way. The, this, this man, this Roman, Roman, not even a Jew, said, go tell him. He doesn't have to come under my roof. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus said, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at this. I've never seen this kind of faith in Israel. I haven't seen it among the Jews, only among the Gentiles. And the Bible said that he was healed from that very hour. God has a way of being touched by faith. We can, God can be touched and we can touch him. Now here's another faith. This is another kind of faith. This is a supernatural faith. This is not natural. You don't develop this. It's a gift from God that God gives you. It's the ability to believe God above the normal in your life. 1 Corinthians 12 and 9. To another, talking about nine gifts, to another faith by the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit. It's supernatural. And if you have the gift of faith, when it operates you see things happen that normally cannot happen. We have levels of faith. We also have levels of doubt. His name is Thomas, a.k.a. Doubting Thomas. I think he's got a bad rap, but that's what they call him. Three and a half years, walked with the Son of God. Three and a half years, saw blinded eyes open, food multiplied, saw many miracles, even saw the dead raised back to life. But in the heat of the moment, he doubted that Christ was even resurrected. Not only did he doubt, but Adam doubted, Eve doubted, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, David, Elijah, John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, even Jesus' internal family, his siblings, and all of those around him doubted that he was the Son of God. So if you ever have doubt, you're in good company. But it's not a permanent address. It's only a temporary address. You're moving on. Why can't we live there? Because we're saved by grace through what? 
We're saved through faith. You have to believe. You have to release that faith. And if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you can believe anything. If you believe, now listen closely and think what I'm saying. If you believe he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, think about it, born of a virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, cross. three days later, come out of the tomb alive and showed himself alive by many infallible passions and spoke to them pertaining to the kingdom of God. Went up into heaven when angels escorted him up and speaking to the disciples. Went to heaven and sits up there today at the right hand praying for you. And he's going to come back someday and resurrect all the dead and catch the living saints away. And we're going to be with him for eternity. Do you believe that? You can believe anything. The rest of this Bible is easy. You remember the little boy that went to vacation Bible school? And he came home from vacation Bible school. And his mother said, what did you learn? He said, I'm nothing. She said, no, tell me. He said, I'm nothing. She said, tell me. I know you. They taught you something. He said, okay. Two generals, Moses and Pharaoh, got in a fight. General Moses didn't have any army. He had the Navy Seabees, and that was about it. General Pharaoh had it all. He had the Marines, the Army Air Force. He had it all. He had tanks. He had armor personnel carriers. He had everything you need. He had M uh, M60 machine guns, hand grenades. Uh, he had AK-47s, and uh, he had it all. And he got after General Moses, and Moses on the run, and he hollered to the Navy Seabees, build us a pontoon boat across the Red Sea. And they built it. They blew it up and built it. And all of General uh, Moses' army ran across the Red Sea, and they got to the other side. He said, Seabees, go back in there and put Bangalore torpedoes on it. And when Moses, uh, uh, General Pharaoh gets out there, blow it up. So they did. Pharaoh got out there and they blew it up and all that army drowned. And the mother looked at him and he said, son, she said, it's been a long time since I've been to Bible school or even read the Bible. But I won't remember it being like that when I read it. He said, mother, if I told you what they told me today, you'd never believe it. <laughs> you have the ability if you believe that Jesus is the son of God to believe everything else in that book. We're saved by grace through faith. James says, let him ask in faith, never doubt him. Why? Because if you doubt, you're like a wave of the sea tossed to the wind and driven, and that man will not receive anything from the Lord. It doesn't mean natural. That means spiritual. If you're double-minded in your spiritual walk, you're frozen spiritually. You may make a million dollars. You may have a great family and a great home, but spiritually, you're frozen you see, not only this, but entire cities doubted him. In Matthew 11, Jesus said, if these other cities, if I did the miracles I've done there, they would have repented, but you refused to repent. Matthew 11, I mean 13, 58, now he did not many mighty works there. Why? Because of their unbelief. Unbelief can kill it. You get in the altar praying with someone and you're not believing. Walk back, walk away. Wait till your faith rises up because it does have an effect. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to be there in a moment. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts. Keep this in mind. Now I'm talking to you about supernatural spiritual gifts. What I name will not be normal, natural. They're supernatural. They come from God. Brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. I have been ignorant. I was ignorant of the Bible. I studied. I am not ignorant of the Bible any longer. I've studied the Bible. If I had not studied the Bible, I would have stayed ignorant. Now, you can teach ignorance, but you cannot teach stupidity. I know that offends you. Here's what you are when you're stupid. Oh, a lot of people don't even like that. Well, I don't really like it, but I'm enjoying saying it right now. When you're, you have the ability, but you refuse to learn something, then you'll remain stupid there. You're looking at a guy that is stupid when it comes to calculus. And you're looking at a guy that wants to stay that way. <laughs> I'm not very good on my cell phone. My son-in-law and my brother-in-law want to teach me. I'm not going to learn. I want them to do it for me. So I'm going to stay stupid there. But I'm not in the Bible, and I'm not concerning spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, let's go to verse 4. There's different kinds of gifts, but it's the same Holy Spirit that gives them. Remember in Ephesians 4 and 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's different ministries, verse 5, or services, but there's one Lord Jesus. What's the progression? There's different activities, operations, but it's the same God. Verse 4, Holy Spirit. Verse 5, Jesus. Verse 6, 
God. So they all work in the power of the Holy Spirit. Watch verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, is given. It's a gift. It's a gift you receive. You don't earn it. It's a gift you receive. I want you to say it. It's a gift we receive. It's a gift we receive. Okay, for each one of us, for why? To profit all. It's for everybody. It's inclusive. It's for people in this church you love. It's for people in this church you like. It's for people in this church that you, well, we won't talk about it, but it's for everybody. Your gifts are to bless and help everyone. For it is given, it is given, verse six, 8, and this is through the Spirit. And then he says, by, let me jump to verse 11. Let's go down to verse 11 real quick. Time's limited. But one and the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, works in all of these, distributing to each one individually as he wills. He gives you gifts of the Spirit, that you're filled with the Spirit, as he wills. Not as the pastor wills, not as your family member wills, as he wills. Now, sidebar, let me tell you something. Romans 1, 11 and 12, Paul said, I long to come to Rome and see you. Why? That I may impart to you some spiritual gifts. So there is an impartation that God will move on someone to pray for you and impart a gift to you. Later on, Paul will admonish Timothy in 2 Timothy, and he will say, Timothy, Stir up the gift that was given unto you by the laying on of hands. Whether it was a presbyter or the pastor of a church, it's debatable, but it was a gift. Now, there's nine spiritual gifts, and they're divided in categories of three. <laughs> categories of three. Keep that in mind. Nine of these supernatural gifts. There's many other gifts, but these are the nine we focus on today. What is the most controversial gift? Tongues. Tongues. Everywhere I go, and they're not Pentecostal. Do you speak in tongues? Yes, I do. Would you like to also? <laughs> There's two different types of tongues I'll focus on. One is a prayer language tongue. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you will pray in the Spirit. This is to pray to God, and it's to intercede through you and pray things you don't know you have need of, and to call out to God for things, and to quit praying for your own desires and pray for what God wants. And this is a tongue that cannot be understood Neither can Satan understand it. So God intercedes through you. That's why Romans 8, 26, watch closely. Watch this. Likewise, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, also helps our weaknesses or infirmities. We do not know what we should pray as we alter as we should. Sometimes you don't know how to pray. When Charity lost her first baby, I didn't know how to pray. I was angry. I came here and struggled. I didn't know how to pray. The Holy Spirit would pray through me at times till I worked my way through it. But the Spirit, Holy Spirit again, himself will make intercession for us. How? Even with groanings that cannot be uttered. I've done that. I've experienced that. I know what it is. This is written to the church. This is not written to sinners. This is not past. It's written to the church. I pray in the Spirit. I pray in tongues every day. That's a prayer language. Uh, it edifies me. It doesn't edify anybody else. It builds me up. It supports me, and it helps me. Let me tell you something. Are you a complainer? I am a complainer. I complain a lot. I can walk in this room. I won't see how clean it is. I'll see how dirty it is. I'll see one spot of dirt. I'll see one piece of paper. One of our custodians one time said, Pastor, you can really see dirt good. <laughs> I complain. I complain about everybody in my mind. In my mind, I have fired every pastor in this church two or three times, except myself. I kept myself. I, I'm just like that. I can't help it. I can't help it. You know how I help it? Number one, she tells me to quit complaining. That really helps. Number two, I pray in the Spirit. And when I start praying in the Spirit, I quit looking through a glass and it becomes a mirror. And when God does that to me, it's bad. Because I see a railroad tie in my eye, and I see a splinter in yours. And God says, don't try to take theirs out till you get that out of yours. I've been doing this nearly 50 years. I still haven't got it out yet, but I'm working on it. Okay, there's another tongue. This tongue is to be interpreted in the service. This is when somebody gives out a message. And this is a spiritual gift to give it out. It's a sign to the non-believers. It's a sign to the non-believers. It's a sign to the non-believers. And uh, in this... When it's spoken out loud, it should be three messages in tongues and interpreted. After that, it should be no more. 
If you give out three messages, my interpreter should be no more. Now, this is what I believe. Wait till the pastor speaks next week. I'm the minor prophet. He's the major prophet. But if you get up and prophesy, I think three prophecies are enough. I want to preach the word. I didn't come just to hear you prophesy. I come to preach the word. And that is prophesy. I'm going to talk about it later. You may disagree with me, but you shouldn't. But uh, you may. <laughs> so you, you, you give out a message in tongues, and it's a sign for those unbelievers. But most of those tongues spoken in church are not a message to be given out. They're, they're our prayer language. We get excited. We get feeling good. The message is motivating us. The worship's good. And we have to pray real loud in tongues. Oh, we're feeling great. We're praying out loud in tongues. We draw a lot of attention to ourselves in tongues. And we don't know, but we keep praying in tongues. You know what I used to do when Tom was playing the piano and I was over there waiting? Somebody start praying in tongues during the worship. I'm going to interrupt the worship. And I thought, that's a prayer language. That's not a message. I'd go, Tom, play louder. Play louder. He'd go, no, no. I'd say, play louder. Drown them out. You say, well, that's mean. No, it wasn't. It's spiritual. I didn't want somebody speaking in tongues, edifying themselves, everybody else looking at them, interrupting worship, stopping what we were doing, altars full of people, and get all that attention. They didn't mean to. They just didn't know. They don't know how to use the gifts of the Spirit. And so Tom Wood, he was always wonderful. And he would start playing loud, and I'd say, sing it loud. And he'd sing, and I'd come up, and they'd stop. Why? Because it wasn't a message. When it's a message, I've got enough sense to stop and let it be interpreted. Amen, Pastor. Thank you. And, and so, so, you know, it needs to be done in order, what the Bible says. Tongues to be interpreted is, an interna- is a spiritual gift. It's not always received at baptism, but you can. You can receive the gift at baptism. And the gift requires two working together, not only tongues, but interpretation of tongues. You have to have someone to interpret the tongues if somebody's given a message in tongues. Now, if you're praying in tongues, you don't need that. Not, never should, when this worship like today or any other day, people are in the altar, people are worshiping, don't ever stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, worship me and, and I'll bless you. Why would God interrupt what you're doing to tell you to, interrupt, to do it? It would be like me. If all my grandkids and children get together around me today and said, Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, uh, Bobo. They call me Bobo. Thank you for the million dollars you gave me. And uh, <laughs> thank you for the $100,000 vacation we just took. Close to it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And all of a sudden, while they're all just praising me and thanking me, I would stand up and say, Thus saith the grandfather, praise me and tell me how much thankful you are. They'd say, you're not very smart. That's what I'm doing. That's why I don't think God does it. But I may be wrong again, but I'm probably I'm not. The gift of prophecy. Let's talk about the gift of prophecy. It's greater than the gift of tongues. It doesn't need a support. It doesn't need any help. It stands on its own. Prophecy is where you stand and prophesy. It takes more faith to prophesy, the measure of faith, than it does to speak in tongues because you got to crush that. Have you ever been sitting out there with a message burning in you and you wouldn't speak it and then somebody speak in tongues and it would release it? I have because I didn't have the faith to prophesy. And that's what it does. It doesn't require another person. You may prophesy to yourself. I've prophesied many times to myself. I spoke God's word to myself, and it's come to pass. I felt the prophecy coming. Uh, I, I've, it, it, I'm speaking, it, it's a gift that will say, touch believers and non-believers alike. Prophecy is speaking the word of God, preaching it, what I'm doing now, or foretelling something that's going to happen. And it's a word of blessing, correction, and instruction. Prophecy is powerful, but it's conditional sometimes. If my people, which are called by my name, if, we forget the if, prophecies sometimes are conditional. Some of you say, well, I got a prophecy that never happened. They're conditional. Um, I'll move on, but they are. Let me give you an example. Uh, Acts 21, verse 10. There, there's uh, Paul and them, these prophets uh, were staying many days and they were waiting to go somewhere. Uh, Paul was. Uh, Agabus come down. He took Paul's belt and bound his hands and feet. He said, if you go there, you're going to be bound. And Paul said, I don't care if I'm bound. I'm ready to die. I'm going anyway. So he knew it was a prophecy what was going to happen, and he, 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 did, he did go. The word of prophecy. You don't read in the Bible where anyone spoke with tongues and interpreted. And people will bring that up to you. The reason you didn't, these disciples didn't need it. You read where they spoke in tongues when they received the Holy Spirit, but not for an interpretation. They all prophesied. A word of prophecy is greater than tongues and interpretation because you don't need the other, and it stands alone, and it speaks powerful. It takes a measure of faith to do this. The next three gifts, let me work on this. They are the gift of discerning spirits, the gift of word of knowledge, and the gift of word of wisdom. Second group. Discerning is different than simply discerning. Saying, I don't like them, or they got this, or they're that. You know, that's just your opinion. 
But discerning spiritually is a spiritual gift that helps you to know by what spirit they operate, whether it's a good spirit or bad spirit, what motivates them. Look at Acts 13, verse 9. Paul is filled, the Bible says, with the Holy Spirit, and it makes that clear. Isn't that funny? In verse 9, it will say, fill with the Holy Spirit, because this is spiritual. It's not natural. And he said to this person, watch this, oh, all, all, all full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to pervert the gospel of the Lord, which is Jesus Christ? I indeed, and now indeed, the hand of the Lord be upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a mist fell over him, and he couldn't see. Isn't that something he prophesied that? Okay, I'm walking down the hall here today, and this is a metaphor. Let's say somebody came up and said, Pastor, I didn't like the service last week. Music's too loud. Pastor, I didn't like the preaching. They preached too long. Pastor, I don't like this. I don't like that. Somebody got my parking space. I don't like this. And I just turned around and I said, Oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to pervert the, the straight way of the Lord? Now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you'll be blind through this service. You don't learn that in the school of evangelism. You would not like Paul as your pastor, the Apostle Paul. <laughs> you would run out of the church and you'd say, he's crazy. But I'm talking to you about biblical examples. Acts 16, they went to a certain place to pray. A girl followed them around. Oh, these are men of the most high God. They're showing you the way of salvation. These are the men. Wouldn't you like as a pastor, somebody following you around, he's a great man of God. He's, he's going to show you the way of salvation. He's got the great message. But it was not the Holy Spirit. It was a demon spirit trying to identify with the work of God. People that can discern will say, I will not let Satan identify with my ministry or be a part of my ministry. Whatever they're saying, good or bad, Satan loves the church. He loves spiritual things. He is a spiritual being. Music flowed from him in creation. He loves being here. He hates Jesus. He hates you to worship God. He hates for you to hear the word. But he's spiritual. And when Paul turned to this girl, after many days he was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, not the person, the spirit. You sometimes go into arguments with people. One man said years ago, you talk about me all you please. I'll talk about you on my knees. Get down and start dealing with that spirit in that person. And that person will start changing. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out. I'll never permit Satan to identify with the work I'm doing. We had an evangelist come in here from the great Brownsville Revival. Man, a powerful revival. Brother Kilpatrick, a wonderful man of God. And, but this evangelist was not Brother Kilpatrick. He was another evangelist. He preached us two revivals, two weeks, uh, Sunday through Wednesday. And we had, in those six or seven days, we had maybe 100 some people saved. Uh, I can't remember, 80-something baptized in water. We'd have baptism, and they would run in the door and with their clothes on and jump in the baptistry and get baptized. God was moving. But at the end of one of the services, he said, first time a young person gets killed on the way home in a car, we're going to have a revival. I said, you just cursed my church. You're not going to do that. I said, meet with me tomorrow night before church. He knew I was after him. He came in after church started, got up and preached again. He, he, he thought, well, I've, I fooled him. I thought, no, you didn't fool me. He preached. We had several people saved. Altars were full. I went up and I said, the revival closes tonight. We no longer have revival. The evangelists will not be back. Uh, we've had a great revival. Thank you for coming. A family in the church walked up to me and they said, my son or daughter, or my daughter or son-in-law, whatever, got saved in this revival. God has changed our life. You close it, we're leaving the church. I said, I'm closing. It's closed. Don't, please don't leave the church. They left. There was a divorce later on in that family. I sat down on the front. I put my face in my hands. I was crying. I thought, what an idiot I am. The biggest revival this church has ever known. 
I'm getting known throughout the denomination in this city. We're packed at night and stand late at night. What an idiot. And God spoke to me and he said, because you honored my word and you would not let people curse what I blessed, I'm going to honor you. Every elder come and sit down by me. They said, Pastor, you made the right decision. We support you. That Sunday, the power of God hit this place. We started having revival Sunday morning, Sunday night on Sunday nights. We'd stay at 11 o'clock at night. And you'll, if you're not familiar with this, you won't understand it. People are so drunk in their spirit, we'd put them in a wheelchair, roll them out to the car, lay them in the seat, and somebody'd drive them home. And the next day, they were still out under the power of God. Now, those revivals don't last forever. You've got to learn how to just go back to some normal, more normal stuff. But God poured it out for years and years, and we had several saved. If I'd let that man curse what God had blessed, we'd be in trouble today. I'm telling you, learn to discern the spirits. Uh, I, I'm going to move on, but I had a lady stand up one time here, said, as my bones were broken on the cross, so shall yours be broken. I said, uh, well, that sounded good. Only thing, it's not biblical. Uh, I did it from the pulpit. You, you stand up in a church and say something. If it's unscriptural, you need to be corrected in front of the church because somebody's going to walk in there and believe that. I said, Psalms 34 says, no bones shall be broken. Uh, John uh, 19, 36 said he was on the cross and they came to him. They did not break his bones. They did not break his legs. So you don't let heresy go in the church. You stop it. You correct it. Amen. Thank you for the amen. My wife gives me that word of knowledge. Let's go real quickly. Oh, my. Word of knowledge. Some teach this as knowledge of the Bible. It can be, but I believe it's much more than that. I believe it's a word of God's knowledge. You get one word of God's knowledge. Watch my knee. Leighton Power of the Soul, he wrote a book. He said, Adam had all knowledge, all knowledge, supreme knowledge when he was in the garden. God had to cap that knowledge when he sinned. He said, look, God, in Genesis 2, 19, God brought all the animals. God created and brought every animal. He said, Adam, you name them. You've got the ability. You have the power. You have the intellect. And he said, okay, that's a cow. That's a horse. That's a skunk. He got that one right. He named every one of them. What knowledge. God says, okay, now you've sinned. We're going to cap that knowledge. It's not going to be released again right now. Only way what you do, you don't operate through your soul. Now you operate through your spirit. Follow me. Your spirit is saturated with the Holy Spirit. You're walking in the spirit that you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh thereof. You walk in the soul, you fulfill the lust. Don't release this. That's how that superior intellect God lets a little bit out every now and then. We'll have an Einstein or somebody, but we don't operate by our soul power. Josh doesn't lead worship in his soul. It better be by the Spirit. If it's by its soul, it's all about him. It's impure. If I preach out of my soul, it's impure. And I hope you're getting this. This is a little heavier than normal, but he was not mean that you don't do heavy preaching. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll be somewhere else next week. <laughs> he was perfected in his knowledge. You know what I'm saying. He's much deeper than I am. You know what I'm saying. But in the resurrection, in eternity, we'll have all knowledge again. It'll be restored. What was in Eden will be restored. We'll have all knowledge. Someone said, I figured out why the Bible says you won't be married in heaven. You'll be like angels. Because if women know all about you and they have all knowledge of you, they will not want to be married to you. So we will not be married in heaven. We're body, soul, spirit. He's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's the way God created us. This word of knowledge. Joy, you still of she's with the Lord today. We were sitting there, Don and I. We were troubled. We were really, really troubled. Really troubled. All night troubled. Joy got up and walked around and said, God said to tell you this. God's, he's got it. Turn and walked away. What a really, it was all gone. And God delivered that situation, turned it all around. We did nothing. A word of knowledge. God gives you a word of knowledge. We're on, we're on an elevator in Chattanooga at a camp meeting and the night speaker and his wife's on there and Don's being quiet and I'm being nice. They got off the elevator and Don looked over and he said, she said, there's something wrong with that guy. I said, he's our night speaker. He pastors the second largest church in our denomination. He's known everywhere. He serves on all these boards and committees. There's nothing wrong with that guy. She said, there's something wrong with that guy. He preached that night like his coattail was on fire. That means real fiery. And uh, the next night he's not there. He didn't show up because of a lady in his church he was counseling with came forward and said, we've been having an affair for a long time. Him and his wife went through it. I saw this man recently. He's, he's restored. He's walk, working with God. That's a gift of a word from God that we had no way of knowing. We're in General Assembly. We're in Indiana. Jeremy's maybe high school, college, out of high school, whatever. And we're there. And Jeremy's dating a the girl. They're, they're serious, but they're not engaged in the, 
uh, but they're, they're dating each other and serious. Dawn got up the next morning. She said, uh, honey, said, I've dreamed about, and I won't name her, this girl, and I dreamed about she went out with a boy last night, and this is his name. His name is Brandon. I said, oh, wow, because she has dreams. That's why I'm so good. <laughs> Don't you flirt with me. <laughs> I have no choice. <laughs> Just another bad joke. Bad joke. She told you, well, can I go home with you today? <laughs> she told Jeremy about it. He called the girl. He said, my mom had a dream. You went over. He said, you know somebody named Brandon? She started crying. She said, that's my old boyfriend. I went out with him while you've been gone. Let me tell you what. Being filled with the Holy Spirit can protect your babies. It can protect your marriage. It can protect your future. It can protect your life. Why would you be afraid of something that can give you warnings and give you words and give you direction? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. I could talk about a miracle of healing in her aunt, but I won't. It was a word of knowledge, but I won't. Word of wisdom. What's the word of wisdom? It's how to apply the knowledge. It's not just wisdom about God's word. When God gives you knowledge, you need wisdom how to apply it. Have you ever heard somebody get a hold of some gossip in the church? I said, they're too stupid to handle that because they don't have any wisdom. And what do they do? They go ruin somebody's life. Is that too harsh? Amen. Thank you. All right. So what you do if you have knowledge about something, God gives you wisdom how to apply the knowledge. And it's just a supernatural a divine gift. The last three gifts to work of miracles, healing and faith. Real quickly, work of miracles, Elijah called fire up hell. Jesus turned water into wine. I've seen his gifts of healing. T.L. Osborne seemingly had that. Will Branham had it. Oral Roberts could work, walk in that gift. It's a supernatural gift, but you can't just turn it on and off. You can't go to the hospital and empty it out. You're not able to do it. But when the gifts of healings, plural, plural gifts, healings, comes on you and you pray, they're healed. It's not James 5, is any sick among you. It's, they're healed. It's a spiritual, supernatural gift. You may be walking through a place. There's a few people that's had that through the years. Um, several have had it. I uh, heard one man recently say, if you're afflicted with wealth, I can heal you of that. <laughs> Gift of faith. Believe in God for things that are not normal. I came here one day and I was meeting with a minister before we ever had the first service. They said, what are you here to do? Out of my mouth, I prophesied. I said, build a church of a thousand people. I thought, what did I say? And then God gave me the faith to believe that and it happened. And then later he spoke to me. He said, believe me for 3,000. I haven't done it. I failed in that. I've struggled with it. And we don't have 3,000 yet, but we will under new leadership that we have now. I'm not going to talk to you about, I won't give you all the scriptures, but the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. Jesus baptizes you with the Holy Spirit, and we baptize you in water. You just saw that today. The Holy Spirit will heal relationships. It'll change lives. It'll turn you around. The last words that Jesus said on the cross, not on the cross, <laughs> with his disciples, after being with him 10 days, teaching him. The last words before he went up into heaven, it was spoken in Acts 1 and 8. You're going to receive power. And when you do, the Holy Spirit's going to come up on you and you're going to be witnesses. That is the primary function of the Holy Spirit, I believe, to be a witness. From that, you got all these gifts that are wonderful. You can shout and dance, speak and dance, wonderful. But to be a witness and share your faith and make disciples, that's what God wants to do. There is healing in this, and I want you to know Jesus loves you. He died for your sins. My time is gone. Thank you for letting me share God's Word with you. If you believe God's Word is true, it will not return void. Stand to your feet and give Him praise for His Word today.